first ever remote control for a consumer electronic device was the Philco Mystery Control, which allowed the user to control their radio from across the room wirelessly using a battery-powered, low-frequency radio transmitter. This was back in 1939 that this was released as a standalone product. Almost 50 years before that, in 1894, the British physicist Oliver Lodge used a simple mechanism called a Branley's coherer to make a mirror galvanometer move a beam of light from a distance. Guglielmo Marconi and William Priest refined this method for a demonstration two years later, during which they made a bell ring by pushing a button in a box that wasn't connected to the bell by wires. Nikola Tesla filed a patent in 1898 for a radio-controlled boat, which he called a teleautomaton, which he later demonstrated at an exhibition at Madison Square Garden. A radio-controlled robot, which was called the Telekino, was developed by Leonardo Torres Quevedo in 1903, and that same control mechanism was refined to control a boat for a demonstration in 1906. This Telekino device defined a lot of the principles and standards for wireless remote controls that were later used by similar devices long into the future. Quevedo tried to use his device to control torpedoes and projectiles as well in the years after it was used to control a boat, but he was not able to find sufficient funding for the technology. Several decades later, in 1932, a remote-controlled model airplane was developed, and that same technology was used by the Germans for their Wasserfall surface-to-air missile, which was remote-controlled. And then, as I mentioned, in 1939, there was the Philco Mystery Control, a simple device that was derived from very complex prior technologies, released to a public that was largely uninterested in it. But eventually that same technology found its way to another medium, to the television. In 1950, the Zenith Radio Corporation, as it was called at the time, released a TV with a wired remote that they called the Lazy Bones, and a wireless version called the Zenith Space Command, that was the name of the wireless remote, came six years after that. And this remote, interestingly, used ultrasound to communicate with the television set. Essentially, you would push a button, and that button, being a mechanical button, would strike a bar, and that bar would have a given frequency to the hum that is emitted as a result of that mechanical function occurring. The resulting sound was a click sound, and that click earned this remote, this Zenith Space Command remote control, the nickname Clicker. And that name is still used by many people to describe TV remote controls in particular to this day. But as surprisingly interesting as the history of remote controls might be, the type of clicks that I want to talk about today stem from a very different set of circumstances and technologies. And the history of them actually go back far further than that of the TV remote control. Today I want to talk about clicks as they apply to the online economy. You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. The article I want to start with today is from The Guardian, and the article is entitled, How Technology Disrupted the Truth. And the focus of this piece is how a lot of online technologies, but social media in particular, has developed an online ecosystem where journalism that is not necessarily in the public interest, at least in the traditional understanding of public interest, has kind of dominated all other types of journalism, and how, as a result, people tend to have their own set of facts as opposed to a centralized collection of facts from which we all derive our own opinions. And to really understand why this is the case, we have to go back a little bit in time, uh, even further back than the development of the original 
wireless remote control. We need to kind of go back all the way to the beginning of advertising and marketing. And so that we're not just tossing around these terms as if we're all using them the same way, because I think in a lot of cases we're not. Marketing is a term that encompasses all communication from a company or other entity, like a government, to the public. And so there's a lot of different types of communication that fall under the heading of marketing. Advertising is a type of marketing that is intended to promote or sell something. And so this could be a company that is trying to share with you information that is intended to encourage you to buy a product, or it could be a government that uses advertising, and in that case it's typically called propaganda, that is trying to convince you to believe in something or support a particular bill or a law or a movement or to feel a certain type of patriotism. It's safe to assume that informal advertising, that is the informal form of trying to convince other people to feel the way that you do or believe in something that you want them to believe in, goes back as far as the beginning of humanity. It's, it's fair to assume that some primordial man was out there trying to convince some other primordial man to buy their handmade arrowheads or to join their tribe or to support them against another tribe. That, that's probably a, a fair assumption to make. But modern advertising, the type of advertising that you probably thought of when I first said the word, is something that is a lot more recent. Modern advertising began when we started to have brands. And brands are something that emerged with the Industrial Revolution. Now, depending on who you talk to or what you're reading, there's been multiple different Industrial Revolutions, arguably. The one that I'm referring to is the one that started in the mid-18th century and ended, by most accounts, in the mid-19th century. So it was about 100 years of intense change and productivity. And a lot of this change in productivity took place first in the UK, but it very quickly spread to Europe and to parts of Asia and to the United States. And what defined this capital I, capital R, industrial revolution, was the shift from manual labor to machine labor. And so it was the shift to using certain new types of tools like the cotton gin, to using big textile machines that reduced the amount of effort that it took to produce certain goods, the use of certain types of fertilizers and chemicals, the use of steam technology, which produced massive amounts of torque compared to what a single human being could produce beforehand. And all of these combined dramatically changed the landscape, both literally in terms of the number of mines that were dug and the number of railroad tracks being built and the number of warehouses and factories that were being produced, but also in terms of what the economy looked like and in terms of changing where people lived. People were very suddenly moving into urban centers and moving away from rural areas because there were a massive number of jobs created by the Industrial Revolution. Just as many disappeared, obviously, of the more traditional sort of job that one would have in a pre-industrial society primarily working as farmers, actually. Numerically, a lot of people worked as farmers or as some other part of the food creation process back before the Industrial Revolution. But increasingly, the jobs were to be had in urban centers and cities. And so the migration that occurred as a result of this and the social shift and the economic shift was dramatic and impacted almost every aspect of one's lifestyle if you lived through it. And economically, the shift was dramatic because suddenly we had these tools that allowed us to produce so much more than we could ever produce before. Just as an example, if it took a single person a week to make a set of bed linens beforehand, I have, I have no idea how, how long it would have actually taken, but just as an example, if it took a single person a week to make bed linens, those linens would have a certain cost attached to them because the amount of manpower that goes into it, the amount of effort and time and energy 
Consider that these tools then allowed a single person who was working on an auto loom and working on a textile machine of some kind could suddenly produce 10 sets of bed linens in a day. Their output has increased dramatically, and suddenly every single person has the equivalent of superpowers. Every single person that is equipped with this new technology is so much more capable than a person who is not equipped with this technology that there's just no competition. And the economy shifted around that, leaving a whole lot of people behind. If this sounds familiar, it it should. The same thing is happening with our current so-called digital revolution. That's a completely different track and probably a different episode. But what we saw back then is similar to what we're seeing now, where entire job categories are disappearing seemingly overnight. And the people who have these skills or who learn these skills that are suddenly relevant are able to produce massively more than anybody else, any of their contemporaries or peers. And this seems like it would be a wonderful thing, and it was in a lot of ways, but because of the way the economy worked at that time, it wasn't as great as it could be, at least not immediately. And the reason was that most economic effort was dedicated to generating commodities. And what that means is that it was generating raw materials or very simple processed goods. So maybe there was somebody producing bed linens, but they were undifferentiated from the next person who was producing bed linens. There wasn't really a system to tell them apart in terms of quality. It's just that maybe somebody in town makes this good, maybe somebody the next town over makes it, but most people produce like radishes and lettuce and this person brings in iron ore and so it's a whole lot of undifferentiated raw materials or very simple processed goods it very very seldom would you find somebody who put their name on something or who said my horseshoe is better than this guy's horseshoe because x y and z that was not the nature of the economic landscape at the time but because of this sudden boom in production A lot of these industries were flooded with goods, and there wasn't really a way to set yourself apart from the next person over. If you suddenly have a boom in producing horseshoes, and so does the next person over, the market will not bear that many horseshoes. You don't need an infinite number of horseshoes. And so it suddenly became necessary to stand apart from your competition. A lot of these industries were suddenly producing far more than was necessary for what the market would bear. They were producing more than people actually needed, and that meant there was suddenly stiff competition because if you can't convince people to buy your horseshoes, they'll just buy somebody else's, and yours will go unpurchased, and you will go unpaid. And so rather than going into the general store and just there being barrels of oats and barrels of nuts and barrels of of whatnot, that you would just scoop up and buy for a standard price. Suddenly there were a barrel of oats here that were undifferentiated, but then there were Bob Smith's oats over here, and those ones had a markup of maybe just a cent more than the other. But they had a name on it. It was somebody taking credit for it, and somebody taking responsibility, maybe if you found weevils or something in your oats. And we started to see this happening all over the place. People were putting their name and as a result, their reputation on the line for these different goods that they were producing. Now, whether or not Bob Smith's oats were actually any better than the undifferentiated oats was kind of irrelevant to what was going on there. The fact that people were suddenly able to tell the difference between them and were able to at least intellectualize the process of purchasing this thing and saying, I am getting a better experience or at least I should be getting a better experience because I'm choosing to pay a little bit more for the brand name, Oats, that completely changed the market in a lot of different ways. And so we see this happening. We see this growing, these different names being attached to these different products. And it starts in a lot of cases as individual purveyors and producers' names, but then it becomes like the Jones family horseshoes. And then eventually you find conglomerations of different groups, these different families join together to combine their resources and to combine their reputations, or one family buys out another family's resources and production facilities. And so then you're not just seeing somebody's name attached to it, you're seeing company names 
emblazoned across these different packages of things. You're seeing the formation of economic entities. Whereas before, the only real entities that existed were like royal families, and they had these crests and these reputations and family lineages. Suddenly you had pure economic entities that were not necessarily a family. In a lot of cases they were, but not necessarily. And these economic entities had some of the same trappings of these royalty. They started to have these logos, which were derived from these crests that royalty had, that represented them as a company. They had, in some cases, vassals in terms of buying out other companies and adding it to their reputation arsenal, adding it to their family tree. And as these different companies, these different economic entities, began to promote their products separate from these undifferentiated raw commodities, they created the seed of modern advertising. Because suddenly, they had a reason to promote their grain over the next guy's grain. Because if they do not, they will not sell their grain, and they will not be competitive on the economic landscape. And what happened as a result of this is that the people who had these tools and these machines and these factories and these chemical fertilizers and all of these other things that came with the Industrial Revolution, they were able to really open them up. Whereas before, they would produce just a bit more than they actually needed. So they weren't utilizing the full potential of these machines. Maybe they were producing 10 a day instead of one of whatever it is they were producing. And utilizing things like assembly lines and utilizing different shift routines at their factories, they were able to produce 100 a day or 1,000 a day of whatever it is that they produced. Before, it wouldn't have mattered that they could produce this much because there was no way the market could bear that many horseshoes or that much grain. But now that they'd figured out a way and a reason to communicate with the public and communicate the benefits of their grain or horseshoes above that of their competition, they were also creating demand for that product. And as that demand for that particular product and their brand of it in particular went up, they could increasingly benefit from the benefits of scale. And what that means is the more you produce, typically, of a given product, the less each unit of that product costs you. And so if you were to produce bed sheets, producing one set of bed sheets costs you a great deal for that one set of bed sheets. Producing 10, typically, if you can systematize the process and buy the materials that you need for it in bulk, and batch process the responsibilities that it takes to create them and package them and sell them, then it will cost you less per set of bed sheets to produce them. Now take that even further, produce 100 sets of bed sheets or 1,000 sets of bed sheets, and you see incremental gains. It's cheaper and cheaper and cheaper in terms of labor, but also in terms of monetary cost and resource cost to produce a great deal of something, typically over a single set of something. And that's what these machines allowed these people to do. These machines and tools allowed them to batch process and achieve incremental gains in terms of their productivity and in terms of their expenses. The, the, the cost of each unit went down as they produced more and more. But only so long as they could continue to sell all of the products that they produced. And that meant continuing to create more demand for the products that they were creating on this much larger scale. Well, if you look around today and wonder why it seems like most modern economies are predicated on buying as much as possible all the time, we have this moment in time, the Industrial Revolution, to thank for that largely. Because the development of this, the development of brands, and then the creation of demand for these things, and the mechanisms that allows these brands to create demand, created a system in which the more you create, the better you are as a company. Because each of these things that you create costs less, and therefore you make a higher profit typically on each unit. Or you can sell them for less, which creates a competitive edge for you over your competitors who make the same things. But in order to keep those costs low, and in order to maintain your dominance within your sphere, whatever it is that your sphere happens to be, you have to keep that demand steady or growing, ideally. 
And this was something that we started to see at this moment. We started to see the creation of entirely new product categories because we needed them. We needed to keep these factories running at full tilt. We needed to keep these employees busy day in and day out. We needed to make use of all of these things and keep them going all the time or we would lose that momentum. And we've seen this happen several times since then because of the nature of how modern capitalism and modern economies have developed. We've created a consumer culture. Consumption is what keeps all of those wheels spinning. And anytime they've slowed down or began to stop, that has meant the destruction of that industry and in some cases the collapse of entire economies. And so this system, which has brought with it a whole lot of benefits, it's brought a lot of comforts, it's brought a lot of innovation, it's led to a lot of the modern amenities that we enjoy. It has also created a system where if we slow down like a shark, if we, if we ever stop moving, we'll die. The entire thing will collapse around us. This is why when something goes wrong internationally, in a lot of cases our politicians will encourage us to buy things. We saw this happen after 9-11 here in the United States, where the advice that we got from our politicians was to go out and purchase things. Because if the economy is on the verge of a collapse, or if investors are getting worried, the best way to keep things stable is to buy more. And again, I, I don't want to make it sound like this is something that's purely horrible. It's a little bit weird to look at it that way because you feel a little bit trapped needing to continue to buy or to be part of a system that encourages you to continue to buy and need things that you don't actually need to buy uh, in most cases. A system that is incentivized to make you feel like you're not enough or to make you feel incomplete unless you have this XYZ product that they are pitching. It can feel very suffocating to be a part of that once you recognize what's happening. A little bit exhausting too. It can feel like the whole thing is about to crumble at any moment. But I cannot emphasize enough at the same time how beneficial this has been. Compared to every other system that we've ever used throughout history, this has been the best one. All of the others might have certain things that have been better than this version of capitalism, but they've had downsides that were far, far worse by almost any metric that you choose to apply to it. And so are there ways to do something like this and have the same benefits without the negative trade-offs? I don't know. If there is, I, I don't think I've seen it. But I think it's important to recognize the downsides of this sort of system while also being capable of recognizing the upsides so that then whatever decisions you choose to make in terms of consumption but also in terms of how you view the economy, you can do that with open eyes. And, and the fact remains that although it can be somewhat panic-inducing and a little bit stressful to be part of this go, 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 buy, buy, buy system. It's also a system that has led us to an immense amount of technological evolution, social change. It's created some semblance of meritocracy that didn't exist before, while also allowing us to push very egalitarian ideals because a consumerist system does not differentiate between your gender or your race or your sexual identity, or, or anything else in most cases. In a lot of cases, if you look historically at the free market, or the, the so-called free market at least, it has tended to be a little bit ahead of all of the social changes that we later enacted, because a cold, heartless system like this one, <laughs> which has so many pros and cons, one of the pros is that it tends to treat everybody with spending cash equally. Now, there, there's a lot more that I could say about that. This might be something that I'll have to do an entire episode on at some point. But all of that history is wildly fascinating, and I totally encourage you to do some reading on it in the meantime, particularly about the role credit and debt has played in the development of the modern economy, because that's something I won't touch on at all. It's, it's so big and so wild, but very much worth the read. It's very eye-opening. But I wanted to explain the development of the advertising industry and how brands played into that and how the development of new technologies played into that because it helps me get to the modern age or at least the beginning of this digital revolution age that we are currently involved in. It helps us get up to the 60s and 70s and 80s, the time period during which the foundation of the internet was first poured. 
For those of us living through this revolution, it can kind of seem like the internet's always been here. Like I, I remember a time when there was no internet, or at least not a publicly accessible internet, but only just barely. And a lot of people who are alive today and making decisions today don't remember that, which is kind of strange if you think about it, to have been born with the existence of devices that connect you to every other person on the planet and to essentially the sum of human knowledge. That's, it's absolutely crazy. And I cannot wait to see what happens as a result of that being essentially a part of somebody's DNA, somebody's cultural DNA and intellectual DNA from the moment that they're born. But despite that, and despite what's happening now, the internet was not a definitive thing. It wasn't something that was necessarily going to happen, and it certainly wasn't something that was going to go the direction that it went. Now, back in the 60s and 70s, there were a bunch of small internal networks that were primarily running within the same building or between a series or usually just one or two buildings that were in the same region. And these networks allowed the people within that building or within that cluster of buildings to communicate with each other in a very simple way. But they all used very different methodologies to do that, very different ways of distributing that information, of turning it into packets, which is the method that eventually won out, of sending pulses. There were a lot of different protocols in use. Essentially, every single protocol was a little bit different from every other protocol, and some were radically different from each other protocol in existence. And so the ARPANET that was developed by the government, the U.S. government, was developed during the Cold War to try to unify these networks. And it started out as its own small network, but eventually was developed into something more because the American military wanted to ensure that there were networks connecting their military installations and academic installations, which were a big source of R&D for the military and the government at the time in particular, still today, but perhaps even more so at the time during the, the height of the Cold War. And they wanted to ensure that these networks would not go down if any one of these installations was destroyed by a nuke from the Soviet Union. And so what that meant was developing a network that was more like a web rather than one long strand, where if you knock out one of the nodes, then all of the subsequent nodes after that would be disconnected from either end. Think of it like a series of Christmas lights, and if one of the lights goes out, it knocks out the entire strand. They didn't want that, and that's how a lot of these networks worked. They wanted a network that if you knock out any one of these nodes, and ideally multiple nodes, then you could still communicate with all of the other nodes that are still on the network. And so they created ARPANET that allowed for what they were calling internet working, which allowed all of these different networks to connect with each other and communicate with each other. And its protocols played well with the other protocols that were in existence. It was like an adapter for the language that all of these other networks were using internally so that they could all communicate with each other. In 1974, there was a paper that was written about this adaptive capability of the ARPANET to allow all these networks to talk with each other. And in that paper, internet working was shortened to internet, and that name stuck. There's a lot of interesting developments along the way of the development of the internet, uh, the grander internet as we think of it today. In 1986, the internet was connected to a supercomputer, which allowed researchers at these different academic institutions to access a supercomputer from far away. And that dramatically increased the value of this network, and so a lot more people started using it and developing on top of it. And in the late 80s and early 90s, commercial internet service providers, ISPs, emerged. And this allowed individuals and commercial entities to finally plug in to the expanding internet. In 1995, the last existing restrictions on commercial traffic, of which there were many initially, but they incrementally disappeared as they saw the value of adding commercial entities to this network, that le those last restrictions disappeared in 95, And that set the stage for much larger adoption of this network and far more utility of the network as well. But arguably, a lot of that utility would not have existed had it not been for the actions of a guy named Tim Berners-Lee. And 
He had a project that he started working on in the 80s, but which he finished by the end of the year 1990. And this project was the first internet browser. Because up until this point, the internet was a very sophisticated and very opaque to most people type of network where you had to understand and to be able to code at a very root level in order to utilize it, in order to utilize the powers that it allowed certain types of people. And as a result, it was used for very specific things, but it wasn't used super casually. There simply wasn't a way to use it that way. There wasn't any reason to utilize it that way because everybody on it was largely a professional. And the only way to use it was not terribly entertaining and not useful for entertainment of any kind. It was simply useful to distribute certain types of information. And so what the browser allowed people to do is to utilize this network without having that sophisticated grasp of programming knowledge and other technologies. And by the end of 1990, Berners-Lee had developed the HTTP protocol, which is what allows information from the internet to be displayed as a web page. The HTML programming language, which is what allows you to define how things look on web pages. The first software server, the first web server, and he developed the first web pages, which, of course, defined this larger project that he had developed all of these things for, the World Wide Web Project. And what we have today is based on this system that was built back then, but it is orders of magnitude larger and more complex than what existed at the beginning. Today, we still make use of internet browsers, we still make use of the HTTP protocol, we still make use of servers, we still make use of HTML. All of these things have evolved to certain degrees, but we still use those things. It's just that on top of it, or to the side of it, we also utilize the internet in different ways. We use the internet for email, which existed back then, but it was far simpler than it is today. We also use it for telephony, telephone systems over the internet. We use it for social networks. We use it for file sharing services, centralized and peer-to-peer. -peer. We also have e-commerce systems today. And the development of e-commerce systems, I would argue, was one of the foundational bricks that was laid in developing the modern internet. And this is another thing that's difficult to remember, but even after we had the internet for a very long time, nobody was using it for anything commercial. Nobody trusted the person on the other side of that internet connection. They were just kind of random people at other military installations or at other academic institutions or eventually other individuals that were geeky enough to be connected to the internet in the early days, but they were more akin to like ham radio operators, where it was a really niche kind of hobby. It wasn't something that just everybody understood or knew about. If you Google early internet and look at the ads from this time period and the newspaper articles from this time period, it's hilarious. With the gift of hindsight that we have, knowing how it all turns out, it is just so funny to see how baffled people are by the internet. And frankly, in a lot of cases, how little they think of it. They think it's a passing fad. They think it's a fun gimmick. It's a hobby in the same way, like a remote-controlled airplane might be a hobby. But that began to change in the 90s. And the first ever secure online purchase took place in 1994. Some brave soul paid $12.48 plus shipping on August 11th, 1994. For the Sting album, Ten Summoner's Tales, as a CD, as a compact disc. And there wasn't exactly a tidal wave of purchasing happening after that, but slowly but surely it developed, and slowly but surely, online brands emerged. And in the same way that they emerged back in the Industrial Revolution era, those names became trusted. And companies like Amazon, which was only a bookstore when it first emerged, started to pop up and they started to become trusted because they focused on their reputation, and they focused on ensuring that people felt comfortable sending money to strangers across this new communication tool. So e-commerce, that development, was vitally important. It was a, a vital next step that needed to happen after the development of browsing technology and display technology and more intuitive programming technology. But what happened next, I would argue, is in some ways even more important than the development of e-commerce. And it is the 
result of a company that was initially founded under the name Backrub. And it was called that because it was a search engine that took backlinks into consideration when determining how valuable and relevant a particular website was for the purposes of presenting it as a result for a given online search. Which is to say that if you searched for books, this search engine would take a look at as many different websites as possible, as it could crawl, as it's called, and then take a look at not just the keywords on that page, like most other search engines did at the time, but also at how many other websites are linking to that page. And this helped it develop an understanding of online reputation and how many other websites considered this site to be the most relevant in terms of that particular term. And this site, which started out called Backrub, eventually changed its name to Google. And it was started at Stanford on Stanford servers in 1996, and then incorporated and was operating out of a garage in 1998. By mid-2011, it was surpassing 1 billion unique users each month. And by the year after that, 2012, it was earning $50 billion in revenue each year. And so it's, it's a bit of a leap when we're looking at how fast things happen during the digital revolution. It's a little over a decade between that founding and their big billion users a month mark. But it's still incredibly notable. And what happened in the interim was the further development of all of the foundational internet technologies and the World Wide Web, browsing, email, etc., secure payment system technologies, but also the development of a few online behemoths, things like Amazon. And Amazon grew in part as a result of Google and other companies like Google and their ability to send people who didn't know what they were doing on the internet to interesting things that they wanted to find. And it's really on the back of this search technology which opened up the web that was so obscure and so difficult to navigate to people who were not already interested in the technology and were not helping to build it. It brought in the common man. It brought in everybody else who was not part of the innovative first steps. And the initial reception that greeted this bulk of people is what later became known as the Web 1.0 generation. And what that meant is that a lot of people, if they had anything, if they developed a presence of any kind on the internet, it was usually a single static website. And it probably was based on a hub site of some kind, like GeoCities. And these people primarily consumed content from other people's static sites or from larger producers who had these multi-page websites. And a lot of these producers were well-established companies or media companies or internet companies of some kind. Web 2.0 is a term that didn't become common until 2004, though it was initially coined in 1999. But in 2004, the first Web 2.0 conference was held by O'Reilly Media and Media Live, and they defined that term as essentially representing that next generation of web tools and infrastructure that arrived around the early 2000s. And what that meant was more secure and more easily accessible and usable and intuitive e-commerce technologies, pages that dynamically loaded content, which allowed people to type things onto an existing page. You could leave comments on these static websites before, but every time you left a comment, it increased the load time. It was essentially chiseled into the same stone that everything else was embedded in. A dynamic website has lines of code that say, pull this from here, pull this from here, pull this from here. And so it's more procedurally generated. It's generated in increments and it pulls different items from different places. So rather than just one stone tablet that has everything chiseled in it, you have these different sheafs of paper that are a lot lighter weight, a lot easier to load and to generate, and a lot easier to write upon impermanently. And so this allowed for the evolution of the web blog, which later became the blog, into something that was a lot more interactive and community-oriented. And it evolved the guestbook, which was a staple of old-school static internet websites, into the comment section. These blogs with their comment sections in turn 
evolved into the initial round of social networks, the Friendsters, the MySpaces, and eventually the Facebooks. And these companies in particular came to define the Web 2.0 generation of online community, online technology, and online companies. Now, from that point forward, our relationship with the web and the internet as a whole became a lot more entwining. We got much closer to these networks and the people on them and the companies on them, the brands and other entities. We spent a lot more time on the internet. The, the numbers that show how many people were online and how much time they spent online is just an incredible hockey stick of a graph. It just starts to slowly slope up and then just shoots skyward post-Web 2.0 generation. And a part of this interaction, like so many of our interactions, was based on commerce. There had to be something that was funding all of this activity. And a lot of what happened during the Web 2.0 generation was funded by something that Google did not invent, but something that they refined and in a lot of ways perfected, at least up to a certain point. That is the online advertisement. And so advertising, as I mentioned before, is not a new thing. This has been around for a very, very long time in some shape or another. And the modern iteration of it arrived quite a while ago as well during the Industrial Revolution. And so this is a, a familiar concept, the idea of putting out word about what you have to offer and your brand's reputation and your logo and why people should buy from you rather than from your competition. And it's all for the same reasons that it was back then so that you can continue to produce on scale and benefit from that scale, produce things faster and cheaper, and as a result, earn more profit. That keeps the entire economy spinning. And the internet allowed for a kind of novel application of this, because no longer were you just seeing advertisements in your phone book and in your newspaper and on television. You were now seeing ads alongside and sometimes tucked within your search results. And so it started to influence the way that we searched, but also to influence the way that we shared information about our businesses. And this model, more than anything else that Google has ever done, and they've, they've become a massive, sprawling, multinational company at this point with a lot of different revenue streams. The biggest is still their advertising wing. And that department is something that's been replicated by many different companies, many different people have come up and tried to compete with Google. Google still owns the lion's share across most of the planet. And as a result of this dominance, particularly during the early 2000s and the 2010, 2011, 2012 era, that meant that Google was also funding a great deal of the activity that happened online. And the way that this worked essentially was that if you were somebody who wanted to start a blog, and you wanted to try to make a living off of it, or maybe just to earn some pocket change from it, what you would do is sign up with Google, and you would sign up to display their advertisements through your blog or your website or whatever it is that you were producing. And that meant that anytime somebody either viewed or clicked on one of these advertisements, depending on the agreement that you made, you would earn a fraction of a cent, or maybe as much as a dollar or two, depending on the agreement and the type of ad. And so this led to a decade or two of this incredibly obtuse, very advertisement-heavy internet experience, where if you got on the web, a lot of what you were seeing was banner ads and sidebar ads. There was an entire vocabulary developed just for the types of advertising that you see on websites. This, like so many things, and like so many things related to commerce and capitalism in particular, is both a boon and a curse. And the reason that it's a good thing is that it allowed a lot of companies that otherwise did not have a business model and as a result probably would not have gone as far as they went or might not have ever been able to get started to begin with and get traction and make this their full-time gig, they were able to make a living off of this work. And so we saw a lot of amazing voices, a lot of amazing content being produced, a lot of amazing technologies and personalities and points of view that emerged as a result of this business model, this advertising-based online ecosystem. But the consequence of this is that 
the internet largely became entirely dependent on this one type of commerce. And that's not 100% true. Obviously, there was still e-commerce sites like Amazon that flourished like crazy. But the media ecosystem and the creation of words and the generation of videos and, and images and the production of non-product content flourished. And the reason that it flourished, the reason that we expect everything on the internet more or less to be free is because of what happened during this time period. Because Google and a few other companies, but primarily Google, created this system in which you could make a living off of other people's attention. You can make a living based on how many eyeballs came to your website and how many clicks you could generate. If you could get enough clicks every month, you could potentially pay the rent. If you got a whole lot of clicks, you could potentially hire an entire staff to help you generate more clicks. We continue to see the consequences of this today. Even though the online economy and the online community is not the same as it was even five years ago, the development of the smartphone changed this in a lot of ways because it changed the way that we communicate and the way that we navigate and the way that we acquire information and the way that we entertain ourselves too by introducing the concept of the app. All an app is is just software, but it's software that is generally a little bit smaller and it's scaled down to fit on a handheld device most typically. And so as a result, this is software that is made for a certain type of device and is bought in an app store or acquired in an app store. Because in a lot of cases, these apps are free. Just like so many websites, most websites that you find on the internet, they are free. And how do they make their money? Up until very recently, the primary way was through clicks, was through eyeballs, was through these advertisements. And some of them are through Google's ecosystem, some of them are through app store specific advertising plans and schemes. But it's all predicated on the same idea. And a lot of people have said this, and a lot of people have said it in different ways, but thinking about it, it, it really makes you realize that if you're not paying for something, chances are you are what's being sold. And what that means is that if you didn't pay for something that you're reading, or you didn't pay for a particular piece of software or an app, if you didn't pay for a movie that you're viewing, then chances are it's your attention and your clicks, it's your time that is being sold by somebody else to somebody else. Somebody is paying somebody to have you there exposed to their information. And that's, that's the way advertising has always worked, but it's become a much bigger and more involved thing now because of the way we interact with our technology today. We are much closer and more intertwined with these networks today. And so an obtrusive, annoying, distracting advertisement is a lot more difficult to ignore and a lot more in our face than it would have been if it's simply an annoying ad in the page of a newspaper that we can just read the article we want to read and then turn the page. It's not so easy to escape from this today. And because of technologies like cookies and like ad trackers and things of that nature, if we see an annoying ad somewhere, chances are we'll see that annoying ad again or some other version of it. It's a very sophisticated set of processes and algorithms and very intelligent people behind these technologies that exist to try to, at the core of things, generate demand, to generate demand for a certain product or service, to generate interest or prestige for a certain brand. It all comes back to the fundamentals. It's just that these things that were once very simple and things that were kept at arm's length are now things that are really all up in our face pretty much all the time. And so it's created a somewhat untenable system for a lot of people. And that has resulted in a lot of the conflict that's currently happening online within this ecosystem. And that conflict takes the shape sometimes of piracy. But the big problem of the day, and this may be something that dates this episode, but the, the big problem that's being encountered by a lot of different entities in particular publishing and production entities of different flavors, is the ad blocker. 
And the ad blocker is itself a piece of technology, is itself an app or a piece of code, a piece of software that allows you to, in most cases, completely block advertisers from dynamically loading on whatever web page or app you happen to be using and viewing at the moment. And what that means is that because the internet and all of its associated pieces are so heavily dependent on this one business model of allowing you access to all of this stuff for free, and then they make their money off of you using those things, viewing those things, being exposed to these advertisements, suddenly the rug has been pulled out from under them, and there's a scramble occurring to try to find a secondary way to make money, or in some cases to try to punish the people who are bypassing these systems. There are several websites that have taken a stand, for example, and will detect if you're using an ad blocker and will load an interstitial page that says, hey, you're using an ad blocker, turn it off and you can view our website. Otherwise, we're not going to let you in. In other cases, some websites are loading a message that says, hey, we noticed you're using an ad blocker. Take pity on us. We don't earn money if you do that. Here's an alternative. Maybe whitelist us so that ads show up on our webpage. We promise not to load anything too annoying, or you can pay some type of fee. And so this negotiating chapter that's just opened in the online economy has proved to be really interesting because it's introducing a slew of new potential business models that might be able to fund a lot of the things that we've traditionally enjoyed and taken for granted about the internet and allow us to do it in a way that allows the producers of this content to continue to operate and to continue to produce this content. Just a handful of the dozens of different options that I've seen that seem most realistic include the advent of micropayments, which is actually something that the original developers, including Berners-Lee of the internet, were talking about working into the core structure of the World Wide Web micropayment systems that allow you to send anywhere from a fraction of a cent up to tens of thousands of dollars to somebody if you want to. And so this currency of the internet would have become a thing that would allow you, in theory, to periodically put five bucks on your internet account. And then every time you visit a website, it would give that website, you know, 0.3 cents or something from your online bank account. This is something that a lot of businesses are trying to figure out ways to build now, but they're having a lot of difficulty. One, because it's very difficult to get people to trust this kind of system. Two, because it's not structural to the internet, it's something that you have to build on top of it. And so anything that they do is necessarily a bit cumbersome because it's not a core part of the way the internet works. And then three, frankly, people are just not used to it culturally we consider things on the internet to be free. And so the idea that you would pay even a fraction of a cent, particularly if it takes a little bit of effort to do so, every time you visit a website just doesn't make sense to a lot of people on an emotional level. There's also the freemium model, which has been very popular within software circles and for apps. But essentially what this means is that you give away something. You give away the core of what it is that you're doing. Maybe you give away almost all of the content that you produce, and then you charge something on top of that if people want additional content or if they want to open up new levels on a game that you've developed or something along those lines. This is something that has proven to be incredibly useful within the app community because a lot of people are happy to play a free game for a while and then after a bit pay a few dollars for additional levels or for more in-game currency or whatever it is that they're offering. A still small part of this movement that's taking place utilizes a benefactor or patronage model. And essentially what that means is it's something very similar to the traditional benefactor model that uh, like the Medici family used back in the 16th and 17th centuries in Italy. And essentially what that means is that someone who has money gives that money to a cause or a person they believe in. And sometimes that leads to favors, like the, the Medicis always had first dibs on whatever art they wanted from the artists that they gave money to, for example. But in a lot of cases, the reason for being a benefactor or a patron of somebody or something is that they simply wanted to see that group of people or that individual succeed. They wanted 
whatever it is they're producing to be in the world. And so if you became a patron of a particular artist, maybe sometimes you would pay them for their work in a more direct exchange, but maybe you'd also give them a place to live, or maybe you would just give them some walking around cash because you think that their work is valuable and maybe they wouldn't be able to produce it if they didn't have that. And the way that that's happening today is a bit different. You, you do see some podcasts and some websites that are directly funded by an anonymous donor or by some foundation or another. But more commonly these days, we're seeing a kind of micro patronage system, which is a bit like the crowdfunding movement, like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, where a group of people all contribute a smaller amount of money to accomplish a larger project. The micro patronage system is seen in a couple different companies. The, the big one right now is called Patreon, which is very aptly named. And the idea there is that an artist or creator of some kind, a creator of things of some kind, puts up a profile and then people give them money, either monthly, just without condition, or every time they release a music video or every time they produce a new painting or illustration. It really depends on the person who is receiving the patronage, but the, the concept is the same, that you give money to this person because you believe in their work. And the idea is that it helps them pay the bills and continue to create this work without having to necessarily create products to sell or without having to slather a website somewhere in advertisements for you to view. Now, there's some aspects of this movement and this shift that are essentially advertising, but advertising done in a slightly different way. As I mentioned before, some websites and some groups and apps are asking people to turn off their ad blockers, and in exchange, what they're promising to do is to put up less obtrusive, less annoying advertisements. And the reason that this is important, it's not just people getting sick of ads, it's because advertising is, is growing increasingly distracting, and almost like the Las Vegas Strip, each ad gets more and more bright and shiny and flashy and loud and intentionally obtrusive to try to get your attention to try to compete with every other annoying and increasingly obtrusive ad that is on the internet, which it will likely be next to some of these other advertisements. So it's an escalation that makes sense from the standpoint of just trying to get somebody's attention. But it really, really sucks for the person on the other end. And so what you're seeing is that annoying aspect of this. But you're also seeing in the mobile internet age that we live in now, where the majority of people actually browse the internet through their phone rather than through a landline or computer, these ads actually cost data to load. And in some cases, a very simple web page that's just text will require a massive amount of data to load. So it takes longer to load, but it also eats up data from your plan, your internet phone plan, just to load this annoying advertisement. And so it's become a real issue in terms of the annoying factor, in terms of the time it takes to load, in terms of the potential cost of you paying for this ad to load onto your phone, this thing that you don't want to see anyway. And then in some cases, there's actually ways for hackers to abuse this system where the advertisement is dynamically loaded onto the website through a piece of advertising software. They can use that dynamic system to instead load malware. So like a virus or a Trojan or adware or something else that you really don't want on your device. They can load that through the advertisement, through the website that has no idea that it's happening. But all the same, they can load it onto your device. And so there's a lot of really good reasons to block this. And so some companies are going the direction of less obtrusive advertising. I, I do wish them the best. I don't know that it will catch on because so many of us have just been so burned by this system, either because they actually have had malware or something loaded onto their device or because they're just sick and tired of the experience of an ad-laden internet. Now, there's another type of advertising as well that some people wouldn't necessarily differentiate because it's very similar to a traditional ad. And it's very, very similar actually to a traditional ad that you might find on like television in the 60s. But the idea is a sponsorship relationship. And so when I think of advertisements, I think of these very kind of soulless, non-specified, almost like a billboard that's slapped in your view. And you don't really care about it. And 
Maybe if you've been tracked around the web by one of these ad trackers, it's somewhat relevant to something you've said or thought or looked at at some point, but typically it's not anything you're going to click on. Like it's the type of ad you see and you think, hey, who clicks on these things? It must be all accidental clicks at this point. We are all savvy enough to avoid these things most of the time. But a sponsorship advertisement is more specific. And the, the place that I typically hear these actually is on podcasts most frequently, uh, or, or other online media, potentially videos and such. But podcasts in particular seem to be a lot better with this because they're trying not to dilute their message. And as a result, you tend to hear a lot of the time, not all the time, but you tend to hear advertising spots is what they are, but they're delivered by the host. So there's not a lot of annoying background music or jingles. The volume doesn't turn up on you. It's, it's nothing flashy and obtrusive, so it kind of fits in with the content a little bit better. And most typically, it's something that has something to do with the content of the show that you're listening to. And so to me, there's a lot of potential there in some industries and on some media and for some audiences to utilize that type of sponsorship experience as opposed to an advertising experience. But it might just be me. I, I don't find these as annoying as advertisements, but some people might. And so I guess that really is in the eye of the beholder and whatever the market will bear. If these things can find other ways to support themselves, then they'll probably jump to that instead. Now, this has been a long, spirally route to take to get back to the original article. But the original article, if you remember, is entitled How Technology Disrupted the Truth. And what I've been building up to here in describing the online economy and the reason that it is really a click based economy is trying to show why this truth distortion is happening and why it's not necessarily, and in most cases, not anybody's fault. It's not an intentional thing. It's more a byproduct of this ecosystem that we have built over the years. Now, as I mentioned, for a very long time now, the predominant business model on the internet, on the web, has been advertising-based. And you get paid based on this system, based on how many, in some cases, how many clicks you get, and in some cases, how many views you get. And as an increasing number of journalism entities and media entities have moved almost completely online. A lot of them still have non-online entities, wings of their company as well, but the online component is the one that tends to be growing in most cases. And so now, because they exist within this ecosystem, they are incentivized as a money-making entity. They need to make money to keep the lights on, to pay their staff, to pay their shareholders. They are compelled and incentivized to make more money. And the way that they make more money in this ecosystem is by generating more views and clicks. And so it makes perfect sense that as a result of this confluence of different influences and historical movements and shifts and evolutions that have occurred technologically and socially and economically, that these entities would be incentivized to draw people in to look at these ads or be exposed to these ads in any way that they can possibly get away with. And so what that looks like is what we're seeing today. It's the very reason that people are increasingly using ad blockers to block out the deafening hubbub of all of these advertisements. They are desperately trying to pull in more people to everything that they publish. Every new article, every new video, every new app. They need to keep people engaged for longer. They need to get people viewing more things and sharing more things and interacting. They need to keep them liking more things because these are the metrics that matter when it comes time to figure out how much money they've earned each month. And so what we see are these link bait headlines that have nothing to do with the article. This article, in some cases, that was hastily jotted together from other people's articles or tweets, because the article itself doesn't matter. What matters is getting people to visit that page so that they get an impression. And an impression is the unit of measurement that shows somebody viewing the page. And so if you have to generate 20,000 or 100,000 impressions on a page before you make 20 or 30 dollars, 
That means you have to generate a whole lot of articles, get a whole lot of people to go to each of these articles, and you have to keep people clicking from article to article as much as possible. And so we get those clickbait headlines that get people clicking, and usually without satisfaction once they arrive at the article itself. You get content farms, which are typically really low quality websites that are full of articles about different random things. And usually these utilize a whole lot of what's called search engine optimization tactics so that they get really high up on the Google rankings for the search results so that more people will click on it, but usually will not be satisfied with what they find because it typically is a copy of somebody else's content or something that was hastily jotted down by somebody who was paid very little to produce three or four hundred of these things every day. Thankfully, a lot of search engines, including Google, update their policies and their algorithms regularly to try to exclude things like this. And a lot of content farms fell off the front page of Google in particular several years ago as a result of one of these changes. But that doesn't stop them from happening. And unfortunately, what we are seeing, and this is a big trend across even very reputable online newspapers and other journalism entities, is that it's just very, very lucrative to publish a quick, meaningless, but very controversial and outrageous piece over a very deep, meaningful, important to the public interest sort of article that they might have tried to focus on before. And so this system really has been encouraging a lot of the shift in popularity from, say, the New York Times to BuzzFeed. Or along those same lines, the increased amount of junk posts that have been showing up on the New York Times itself to try to bring people back and to get them clicking so that they can make enough revenue to keep the doors open and the lights on. Now, the way that this somewhat unfortunate situation becomes even more unfortunate is what happens as a result of this focus on junk news over quote unquote news in the public interest. Rather than being incentivized by the market to produce content that educates people and that tells them data, tells them facts, or tells them very well informed opinions, what these many, many different entities are encouraged to do is to produce things that inspire emotion and outrage, that give a version of or an interpretation of the facts to people who are most likely to respond to those interpretations. And so what that means in a lot of cases, particularly now where social media, social networks like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram play such an important role in the way things are shared and disseminated, the way ideas and links are spread, is that you really want to post something that inspires people to be very happy and share it and like it, or you want to post something that makes people angry and outraged so that they hate share it and try to show people how ridiculous this thing that's happening is. And what that tends to look like in practice is a whole lot more articles that are intentionally produced to either bring glee or outrage to certain portions of their audience, to certain demographics, rather than being unbiased and fact-based and rational. These pieces are increasingly produced to incite emotional response because, again, they are incentivized to do so by this system, this click-based economic system in which they operate. And it's really easy to look at this and say, guys, just stop, stop sucking, stop going down this route because it's very clearly hurting us in a lot of different ways. It's hurting us in that we tend to choose the facts that we want to believe. It's hurting us in that it increases the scope and span and durability of filter bubbles, which is essentially us being surrounded by information that certain algorithms believe that we will want to believe or that reinforce the worldviews that we already have, rather than exposing us to pure unbiased data. And it's hurting us in the sense that, at least in democratic countries, we depend on having a well-informed electorate in order to actually benefit from the system that we enjoy. And this type of bias that is baked in to the business model of these systems ensures that we will never have that. 
you can maybe go outside of the system and maybe sometimes find like a stopped clock that these entities are right twice a day, but the rest of the time they are heavily slanted and in a lot of cases simply not doing the job of journalism in the way that we traditionally think that it is. Now, th this is absolutely not to say that good journalism doesn't exist anymore. A whole lot of it does, despite this system, or in some cases by harnessing this system in some strange and sometimes unpopular way. But it's the exception, not the rule anymore. And ideally, it would be the flip of that. And so it's really easy to say that, but unfortunately, I think most of these people involved in these entities and involved with this tide of really shoddy journalism would love to be involved with better stuff and paid to do better stuff, but this system simply does not support that type of gritty and dense and valuable content. It's incentivized to bypass the vegetables in favor of the junk food. Now, how much of a role does this play in what's happening around the world where conventionally powerful political parties are being upended, outsiders are usurping the establishment, powerful old school businesses are crumbling while new young punk barbarians at the gate rise up in their stead? How much is this contributing to that? It's really, it's hard to say on a direct one-to-one -one level. I'm sure it's absolutely contributing to it in some way, and perhaps in, in a largely positive way. I mean, the, the benefits of the internet and the web and social media and all of these things are immense in that it allows us to be exposed to new things and interact with new people on a scale that could not have been imagined 30 or 40 years ago, even when we had the initial versions of the internet. But I do wonder how much the economics that engulf and surround and intertwine with this system are negating some of these benefits in a very real way, and increasingly so as we become more dependent on this platform, on this medium. It's truly difficult to gauge how much harm is being done, really. And it's difficult to see how much of this harm that I perceive as being harm is actually just a change. It's just a difference. It's a deviation from the way things have operated. And maybe this is the new normal. Maybe I'm fixating on things that are not actually valuable in the absolute sense, but are only valuable because I am biased from the traditions that I think are valuable based on my experiences and background. But I do think it's fair to say, and a fairly unbiased thing to say, that the half-life of mistruth is shorter online in that it's much easier to tear down a lie than it used to be. It's much easier to label it as a lie. And a lot of things that old wives' tales and folk ways that we used to think were truth are very, very easy to debunk in an online-enabled world. But I do think it's also much more likely to happen, mistruths. They're much more likely to hit the public eye and for a while make us believe them until we come across a debunking. And I really don't know if we will be drowned by mistruths before we can debunk them all, or if we'll eventually catch up and be able to establish some legitimate voices that everybody trusts and that everybody looks to, to help them define the nature of reality, rather than picking and choosing the facts and the opinions that suit their existing biases the way that we tend to do today, regardless of which side of any issue we happen to be on. I guess it's fortunate then, in a way, that it's never been easier to distract oneself and entertain oneself. Whether you're clicking the button on a remote control for your television, or clicking on an animated gem or a Pokeball on an app on your smartphone, well-funded sources of entertainment are always within reach. <laughs> So hopefully now you understand a little bit better the way the online economy works and some of the quibbles and qualms that I have with it and some things that hopefully will begin to improve in the near future. And if you listened to the episode before this one, the interstitial episode, 
you'll know that I'm going to start having sponsors for most of the episodes that are released. Having listened to this episode, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of the way that a lot of online marketing works. So for me, it's important to do any sponsorships very intentionally and to be really careful about the types of brands that I talk about and the way that I talk about them and to ensure that the relationships are mutually beneficial so that I can very full-throatedly, enthusiastically talk about these companies and do it in a way that is not annoying. Uh, if you're like me and listen to a lot of podcasts, you hear a lot of the same companies talked about over and over and over again. And a lot of those are not particularly relevant to the podcasts themselves. And that's totally cool. Like, that's a decision that every podcaster has to make. For me, I get a little bit bored when I hear about products or services that are not related to the topic at hand, not related to the attitude or the brand of the podcast itself, and when these messages are delivered in a very rote, planned out, read from a script type of way because then you tend to hear the same thing over and over and over again on all of these podcasts. And again, that's a decision that each podcaster host has to make for themselves. It's not really my thing. It's not something that's effective or interesting to me. And so I'm going to be doing that a little bit differently. I also want to make sure that you guys know how this all works. Like when I give you a link, you know what action can be taken so that the show benefits, so that you benefit, what you get out of it, what the company gets out of it, so that it's not a really obscure, opaque system. I, I find that in a lot of cases when these things are delivered, I'm always wondering who's benefiting from what stage of the process. And so I'll do my best to make sure that you know what steps can be taken so that you can take a look at these things, see if they actually work if you're interested. And, uh, and then the sponsors themselves can benefit as well by having an informed consumer base coming in and checking out what they have to offer. And so the first sponsor that I want to talk about today is a company that I've been using for years and years. Those of you who are aware of my other work know that I tend to dabble. I experiment a lot. That results in a whole lot of projects. My project portfolio really runs the gamut from my blog, Exile Lifestyle, to a publishing company that I co-founded called Asymmetrical Press, to this podcast. And these days when you're building anything, very often one of the initial steps of getting started is building a website or some other web presence. And for me, what I do is I host all of my projects on HostGator. And I've, I've used a half dozen other hosts over the years. Initially, I was using a bunch of different hosts, a different host for each of my different projects. But eventually, I decided to consolidate them all onto a HostGator plan because, frankly, they were the most communicative and friendly and helpful of all of the different companies that I had used. And they have this really amazing plan called a reseller plan where you get a basically a large lump of server space, and you can divvy that out into a bunch of different dashboards. So you have a different dashboard, a different login, a different set of emails for every different project that you want to host on there. And you can even divvy this out to other people. It's called a reseller plan because you can actually resell it to other people if you want to recoup the costs. And what that means for me, I don't resell it, but then I'm able to use it for other people, for friends and family. My parents were running a blog for a little while, and I was able to host that very easily on my reseller plan, because that's kind of what it's made for. And so I contacted HostGator when I was thinking about doing sponsors to see if they would be interested in helping support the podcast. And they wrote back immediately, gave me a very enthusiastic yes. Needless to say, I like them even more now, and I was already recommending them constantly to anybody who asked about services that I used and enjoyed. And so that was a nice extension of the relationship. And the shape that this support takes is an affiliate relationship, which means that they've given me a custom link that I can give out, that I can give to you, and that link is hostgator.com slash LKT, as in let's know things, LKT. And if you use that link, they get a new customer. I get a certain amount of money for each person who becomes a customer. And you get a 
really substantial discount. I was actually really shocked. This is not like one of those, we'll give you five or 10% off types of things. They, they give 30% off as the baseline if you sign up for one to six months. 35 if you sign up for a year. If you do a couple of years, you get 45% off of their shared managed WordPress or cloud hosting packages. And those are kind of the simpler packages. If you're just looking to start a blog or have a website or two, those will be the options that you'll choose. If you're doing something a little harder core and you need a VPS, which is a virtual server, a reseller account, which is what I use, or a dedicated server, you get 30% off no matter how long you sign up for or which plan you choose. And so these are really, really hardcore sales. It, it is super cool that they're willing to do this on top of the affiliate fee that I get paid for bringing in new customers. And so if you're looking for something like this, if you are thinking about starting a new project, if you are trying to figure out how to get that blog started or something along those lines, this is a truly great option to check out. It, they are a great company to begin with. They have really wonderful customer service. I highly recommend them to people all the time. And this kind of just sweetens that deal. And so again, that's hostgator.com slash LKT, a very mutually beneficial relationship for everybody involved. And I am fairly certain that you will enjoy working with them as much as I have. Now, the other sponsor that I have for today's show, it's another company that I've been using for a very long time, another service that I've been using and really, truly enjoying. Audible is the biggest by far audiobook library that's available anywhere. I have a handful of my books that I've written and narrated on Audible, and it was actually listening to audiobooks through their service that initially got me interested in listening to podcasts, which eventually led to me starting my own podcast. Because if you think about it, an audiobook is kind of just like a really long podcast or a, a series of podcasts that all link to one another. And I started listening to them because I needed something to keep me occupied and interested on longer trips, in particular on road trips. And what I'd like to do when I have them as a sponsor on the show, I'd like to give a book recommendation. I hear them, they advertise on a lot of different podcasts, and it's more or less the same deal everywhere you go. It's another affiliate relationship where, in this case, you don't have to become a full-blown customer in order to benefit the show. You just sign up for a month of free service. And that, that's pretty cool. And it's not one of those free service things where you try it out for a month and then it's agonizing to try to cancel your account. You don't have to call a customer service representative. You don't have to be sold to and sold to and you know, have them hinder you and stand in your way when you just want to leave because it wasn't for you or for whatever other reason. Really, really easy to cancel your subscription if you don't enjoy it or if you just don't want it or need it right now. That, to me, speaks of confidence about the service. And basically, if you sign up, you go to audibletrial.com slash LKT. Again, the acronym of Let's Know Things, LKT. That will trigger the affiliate relationship so the show benefits from that directly, monetarily. You benefit from that by getting a free month, and what that allows you to do is get you get heavy discounts on all of the audiobooks that are on their service, and you get a free audiobook each month. So just by going to that link and signing up, you get a free audiobook. You can choose one of mine, or you can choose the recommendation that I have this episode. And the recommendation that I'd like to make is for the last audiobook that I listened to through Audible, and I listened to it across the duration of 40-some hours that I was on the road. And an incredibly long trip that was made very, very pleasant, partially by the, the big sky landscape that's out in that part of the U.S., but partially because this book is so incredibly interesting. And the book is entitled Grunt, The Curious Science of Humans at War. And it's by Mary Roach. She is one of my favorite nonfiction authors. She has this incredible narrative style where she shares these really cool, interesting, obscure facts and details about things. She really fleshes out the context of whatever topic it is that she's covering. And then she does it in, in a narrative style so that she kind of tells the story of her kind of bumbling through these, <laughs> these interesting wings of the, the scientific world, or in this case, the military. 
And it's, it's just incredibly charming, but she has this incredible curiosity and way of writing about these things that's incredibly interesting as well. And so this book is about the science of war, but not about howitzers and AK-47s. The, the closest she gets to talking about guns is a chicken gun, which is a device that is used to fire chickens at jets to make sure that they can survive going through flocks of birds when they take off. And so th- things like that, things like zippers on sniper outfits and how sweat and how scent and horrible fragrances are used in terms of war and how they're prevented. She talks about shrimp and how they can be incredibly deadly and disastrous for submarines. And then she talks about things like the bends and amputees and, and particularly amputees who have lost um, delicate areas of the anatomy and how science is evolving to try to help people who have lost particularly delicate parts of their anatomy. And just, just an incredibly interesting book. This book, entitled Grunt, is just one of many that she has written. I have read every book she's ever published. Previous works that she's written are entitled Bonk and Stiff and Gulp. And these are about the science behind sex and death and our bodies, respectively. All of them are super interesting, highly recommended. And the versions that she has up on Audible are just really well narrated as well, which makes all the difference in the world when you're listening to something that is like 10 hours long. So if you are looking to dive into the world of audiobooks, you're a little bit skeptical but open to the idea, she is a great author to start out with. Uh, If you want to listen to some of the books that I've written, you can also get my books with this free trial through Audible, and you just go to audibletrial.com slash LKT. You benefit from getting this free month trial, which you can cancel at any time. I benefit because I get an affiliate payout, and Audible benefits from potentially getting a new customer. So those are the sponsors for today's episode. Hopefully that wasn't too agonizing. Hopefully maybe you've heard about something you haven't heard about before or found something valuable there. Either way, thanks for bearing with me through the process of figuring out what the sponsorship podcast relationship will look like for this show. You can contribute to the show and help perpetuate and expand it by checking out those sponsors or by going to letsknowthings.com and contributing directly through the options that are laid out there. A dollar an episode is immensely appreciated. Thank you so much to everybody who has been giving through PayPal and through Venmo and through Cash.me. I receive emails every time those come in, and it brings a great big smile to my face. I really, truly appreciate that. You can also contribute by sharing the podcast with a friend, by subscribing if you are not subscribed already, or by leaving a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can find show notes for this show, which they tend to be really detailed, and I share a bunch of additional information and links at letsknowthings.com. You can also subscribe to the newsletter there, find out additional information about me and my work. You can find a complete list of my books at colin.io. You can find me pretty much everywhere on social media at Colin is my name, and Let's Know Things is on Instagram and Facebook at Let's Know Things. Thank you guys so much for listening, for tuning in to geek out with me on this stuff each week. I truly appreciate it, and I will talk to you again very soon. Mm -hmm.